Welcome back to another recorded lecture in our Microbiology for Surgical Technologists book. Uh, this lecture is going to go over chapter six, which is microbial viability and growth. So some things that we're going to be talking about is the conditions that are necessary for microbial growth, uh, methods used in the laboratory to determine bacterial population size, as well as the required nutrients for microbial survival. And then we're going to finish up with a discussion regarding biofilms. There are three essential elements that are required for the growth of microorganisms, and these are temperature, pH levels, and osmotic pressure. And this comes into play even with us in the operating room. And let's say that surgeon wants to take a culture of some sort of fluid that they find, he or she finds. And so we're going to do those two culture swabs that I talked about previously, an anaerobic swab and an aerobic swab. Now, these are time sensitive. So because of these requirements for microbial viability, that's why it's going to be important for us to get those cultures to the nurse, let them know what it is, how the surgeon wants it sent, and then those need to go to the lab right away as not to damage the integrity of the culture. So we're going to be discussing these three requirements in a little bit more detail. So scientists place microbes in one of three categories regarding temperature ranges in which growth can occur. And those are psychrophil, mesophil, and thermophil. And we're going to talk about each of those. Now, whether we're talking about psychrophils, mesophils, or thermophils, they all have a minimum, optimum, and maximum growth temperature. Minimum meaning the lowest temperature at which they can grow. Optimum meaning the temperature at which they grow best and maximum, the highest temperature at which they can grow at. When we have temperatures above the maximum as far as growth temperature, then the microbe is likely to die because the heat is going to denature those proteins or those enzymes. And so they're not going to be able to carry out the practices that they carry out because they're not going to be able to manufacture those proteins that they need to survive and do their work. So let's talk about psychrophils first. Psychrophils are also called cryophils or psychrotropes, and I think of these as the psychos because they like really cold temperature, and I think that is just crazy. Um, but they can grow uh, at a temperature between zero degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius. Um, there are some that can grow at a little bit warmer, quote unquote, temperature up to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, it's interesting because these psychrophils, they contain these polyunsaturated fats in their cell membrane. And so I think of this as like the bear that is like eating all kinds of food and storing up for the winter, right? Is putting on his winter coat, his winter fluff, you know, kind of like how we stay indoors and hunker down when it's cold and we put on our winter fluff, that fat insulates us. And so that's the same thing that these guys do. Um, the next type is the... Um, Oh, and I just wanted to say about psychrophils, something that's interesting is um, if you have something in the fridge that's been in there for a while and you pull it out and you see that it has microbial growth, it's typically these guys, these psychrophils. And scientists say that 65 to 75% of the spoilage of raw milk products is from the species called Pseudomonas. Now the mesophils, these are the ones that we worry about because these are the ones that are most past most pathogenic to humans because it's our body temperature that they like the most. 
and that temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, then lastly, the thermophils. The thermophils can grow at really high temperatures. Remember Geobacillus sterothermophilus, that spore that we use for steam sterilization. This is an example of a thermophil. It likes it really hot. And um, that is about 50 degrees uh, Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius, and the book likens that to the temperature that comes out like the hottest uh, in your faucet at home. Um, these are the ones that you are going to find living in like thermal springs or maybe your hot tub, for example. Um, and then there are certain types of archaea. Remember, we said they're extremophils, so there are some types of archaea that like it even hotter than that and they're referred to as hyperthermophils or extreme thermophils so these are the ones that we're going to find living by those volcanic vents way down deep in the ocean and sulfur is a big part of um, what they use to survive and um, get their nutrients and all those kinds of things most bacteria prefer a more neutral pH environment of 6.5 to 7.5. Remember our blood is approximately 7.35 to 7.45, just a little bit alkaline. So a lot of bacteria like the environment of our body because of its pH and because of its temperature, and that's gonna increase their pathogenicity. If we have bacteria that are preferring a lower pH, we're going to refer to those as acidophils. And that's a 2 to 4 pH typically. And the Massachusetts Institute of Technology figured out how they could use these acidophils to, um, to break down ore in a safer and a non-polluting way uh, than traditional methods of smelting which are making these uh, toxic chemicals and putting them into the air. Uh, and these are our rock biters. Again, they like to break down minerals, and so this is a perfect job for them. They've also been used to break down copper as well. On the flip side, if we have a bacteria or a microbe that really likes a more basic or alkaline environment, then those are our alkalophils. Alkalophils prefer a pH of about 8, and some examples of those are Thermomicrobium roseum and Bacillus halodurans. Now, the osmotic pressure, we've talked about this in a previous lecture as well in regards to isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. If we were to place a cell in a hypertonic solution, then solvent is going to leave the cell, and this is going to cause the cell to shrink. This is also called crenation. This textbook refers to it as plasmolysis. And plasmolysis is something that we use to inhibit the growth uh, of the cell. And this is important in the preservation of foods. So when we have foods that are um, uh, where we've added a really high solution, uh, salt solution or sugar solution, this increases the osmotic pressure. It's going to cause water to leave the cell and that prevents microbial growth. So some examples where this is used is in salted fish and salted beef jerky and also honey are preserved through plasmolysis. Some microbes, such as obligate halophils, they need an environment that's super, super salty, um, like those that live in the Dead Sea. They like about 30% salt. Some are referred to as facultative halophils, which means meh, they don't really care, right? Facultative are like meh, like they don't require a high salt concentration, but they can grow at a higher salt concentration of up to about 2%. And then if we have 
a situation where a microbe or a cell is in a hypotonic solution, this is going to cause water to enter the cell, right? So um, when that happens, then that can cause the cell to rupture or burst that's called lysis. And that isotonic solution is going to give us a normal environment. There isn't going to be any water movement whatsoever. While water is the most important element for microbial growth, carbon is the second most important element. Carbon is a building block that is required by all life on Earth, and its production is used by every living creature, and this is described as the carbon cycle. Within the carbon cycle, there are sources and sinks. Sources meaning they provide more carbon than they use, and examples of this would be forests, fossil fuels, oceans, and the atmosphere. The reverse is carbon dioxide sinks, and that can include forests as well as plants and animals. But a sink is anything that uses more carbon or carbon dioxide than it produces. And this whole cycle represents the process of carbon being con constantly recycled and how it is found everywhere and in everything. Carbon is needed for the production of proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids, and without it, we would not be able to form our DNA. Interestingly, about 50% of the dry weight of a bacterium is carbon. In addition to that, 14% of the dry weight is nitrogen, and 4% of the dry weight is sulfur and phosphorus. Nitrogen is required for the synthesis of proteins, and microorganisms use nitrogen to form these amino acids that make up complex proteins. Now cyanobacteria uses gaseous nitrogen that it gets from the atmosphere uh, through a process called nitrogen fixation. And some microorganisms live really close to the roots of um, soybeans, peas, beans, and alfalfa, and they're able to get their nitrogen source from there, and the plants use it as well. So it's kind of this symbiotic relationship that they have going on there. Bacteria also use sulfur to synthesize sulfur-containing amino acids, such as thiamine. And then phosphorus is required for the synthesis of nucleic acids, as well as phospholipids. And this helps to maintain the integrity of the cell membrane. And it's also integral in the, um, the bonds that holds adenosine triphosphate together. Remember that energy molecule that the cell makes. And then there are some trace elements, some scant elements, iron, copper, zinc, and molybdenum that are also used as well and typically exist in our water sources. Oxygen, on the other hand, when we think of oxygen, we think, oh, everything requires oxygen. But as we have learned, that's not true. Some Bacteria require oxygen while others can't live in the presence of oxygen. So if they like oxygen, they're referred to as aerob, aerobes, which makes me think of aerobic exercise. You need oxygen to do that. And then anaerobic without oxygen, not living in the presence of oxygen. Now, if we have obligate aerobes or obligate anaerobes, that means they have to either have oxygen, obligate aerobe, or cannot live at all in the presence of oxygen, obligate anaerobe. If we have other little creatures that are referred to as aerotolerant, then that means um, they're going to grow but wouldn't be killed by the other situation. So if we have an aerotolerant anaerobe, that means it's going to grow without oxygen, 
but there it's not going to be killed if there is oxygen there and then the flip side would be true um, an example of this would be lactobacillus lactobacillus which um, is used in the production of like pickles and cheese that we eat now all of these microbes are going to produce waste products or toxins um, as they utilize whatever source of nutrients uh, and oxygen or if they perform fermentation because they're in a situation where there isn't oxygen they are going to produce different toxins and so they need processes to neutralize those and so some of the things that they do they can produce um, superoxide dimutase SOD which gonna, is going to neutralize toxic forms of oxygen and all aerobes produce that some that produce hydrogen peroxide, they um, are going to uh, have enzymes that are going to neutralize that. And that's where our catalase test comes in. So they produce catalase as an example. And um, when hydrogen peroxide is added to some bacteria that produce this catalase, there's going to be that bubbling that effervescence remember we talked about the catalase test another enzyme that they might produce is called peroxidase and that is also going to um, neutralize uh, and break down hydrogen peroxide some also produce um, a toxic substance called hydroxyl radical and um, this is when the hydrogen peroxide reacts with metal ions and they don't produce any enzymes to get rid of this but when they come into contact with an organic compound then that is what neutralizes that uh, that toxic substance and so it's important for us to understand the difference between aerobic and anaerobic microorganisms because of something that can occur like gangrene gangrene is occurred by a species of clostridium bacteria and that develops deep in the tissues if we have a situation where a patient has uh, gas gangrene then we are going to leave that wound open because those bacteria don't like oxygen. And so what's going to kill them is being exposed to oxygen. So we're going to leave that wound open. We're going to allow it to heal either by second intention or third intention. Second intention meaning we're going to just leave it open and eventually it's going to scar in and close itself or third intention which is often referred to as delayed primary uh, closure because it's going to start with us leaving it open and letting it close a little bit on its own like granulate in and then eventually we're going to go back and suture the rest of it closed and I know how you like to see the gruesome details and so here are some pictures of gas gangrene you can see this top one is a gas gangrene of the foot and then of the uh, hind quarters and thigh so buttocks and thigh this bottom left one in the middle we have some intestines that's been affected by gas gangrene and then on the far right we have a foot Just like humans, there's many microbes that can synthesize the compounds that they need to make amino acids uh, that they need to build macromolecules, right? Humans are the same way. We can um, manufacture a lot of compounds for our body, but there are some essential amino acids that we have to get from our food. Remember those 20 essential amino acids. And so microbes are the same. And so there's some things that they can't produce themselves. And these are called growth factors. And growth factors can include pyrimidines, vitamins, and purines, depending on what the organism can't synthesize by itself. Uh, and an example would be E. coli. E. coli doesn't require any growth factors whatsoever, but uh, Leuconostoc citrivorum, 
a lactic acid bacterium uh, that's responsible for the fermentation of cabbage requires all 20 essential amino acids, several purines, pyrimidines, and 10 vitamins. It's pretty needy, I'm going to say. Microbial growth is directly related to the progression of a disease, and it starts with something called the generation time. The generation time is the time required for the bacterial cell to divide and double its population. So let's say it starts with a population of 1,000. This is going to be the time that it takes for it to get from 1,000 cells to 2,000 cells. That's the doubling time. Remember that one cell or the, those, um, if it starts with one cell, that one cell is going to become two, those two cells are going to become four, four is going to become eight, eight, 16, so on and so forth. And so for, um, for bacteria, the generation time is going to vary, but most bacteria has a generation time of about one to three hours. And um, after 20 generations, an initial solitary cell could increase to more than a million cells in just a matter of hours. Now, there's bacterium like mycobacterium that has a very slow doubling time. It takes about two weeks. However, uh, we just talked about clostridium that causes gas gangrene. Clostridium has approximately a 10 minute generation time or a 10 minute doubling time. And scientists did an experiment with ground beef that they inoculated with Clostridium perfringens that causes gas gangrene and it had a 7.4 minute generation time. So that is extremely fast. If we have a patient that has uh, an infection of Clostridium perfringens, that infection is going to grow exponentially in an hour or two's worth of time. And that's how we end up with these very severe locally or regional surgical site infections. So now let's talk about the logarithmic graphing of microbial growth. What this basically means is that they are graphing the progression of microbial growth. And uh, typically they use this graph, something like that you see here, and this graph is going to express the cell numbers typically in powers of two. Why two? Because two refers to the doubling time, right? So phases of bacterial growth, there's four of them. The lag phase, the log phase or logarithmic phase, stationary phase, and the death phase. So during the lag phase, What's happening there? Well, during the lag phase, this is a, a predominantly short period of time where these uh, cells are making some adjustments inside themselves and they are getting themselves accustomed to their new environment, right? They're kind of getting settled in. Like when we go on a trip and we pack a big suitcase, when we get to the hotel, it's going to take us some time to get settled in and put things away and, you know, get the room how we want it, right? Or if we move to a new house, there's that settling period. And so bacteria have the same thing and that's called the lag phase. They're not dividing at this point and replicating themselves, but that doesn't mean that they're not busy, right? They're busy getting accustomed to their environment. There's a lot of internal activity that's going on inside them. Then we come to the log phase. And the log phase is when the cells begin to divide. So this is when the um, <clears throat> they're going to be ramping up. And so you see this um, second part of this line is really steep and increasing. This is um, also referred to as an exponential phase. And um, I thought that it was very interesting that the book notes that humans are currently in the log phase of um, their growth curve. And so generation time is approximately 35 years, but no population of orga organisms has 
ever been known to indefinitely continue in this phase of growth. So something is going to happen that is going to force us into the next phase, which is the stationary phase. And look what it says. Spread of diseases from endemic to pandemic will force the world population to enter the stationary phase. Very interesting and scary all at the same time. So that brings us to the stationary phase, which is where growth rate is going to start slowing down. And what happens here is the number of deaths becomes equal to the number of new cells that are produced. And this creates this sort of equilibrium where nutrition, nutrients are being depleted, there's changes in pH because they're producing these toxins and these different waste products. And uh, so growth is going to start slowing. <clears throat> and then lastly, we move into the death phase. And this is the last like sharp drop of this um, on this chart that you see here. And that's where deaths are going to begin exceeding the number of new cells that are formed. And uh, this uh, is going to continue until the population has died out completely or there's just a few cells left. That's why it's so important for us to finish all of our antibiotics, because if we don't, we can leave some of those bacteria, bacteria alive in our bodies and then they can start to proliferate again. There are some situations where we have bacteria that form spores that they could live on indefinitely until the environment becomes ideal for them to then begin to proliferate. Quorum sensing refers to bacteria's ability to literally talk to one another. And this is a form of chemical communication in the form of auto inducers or something that they call pheromones. But what it boils down to is what scientists now have discovered is that as bacteria multiply, they emit these chemical signals from themselves. And as when the chemical signal gets to be to a certain level, they can sense that there's enough of them to either turn on or attack or do something collectively together as a group. It allows for them to coordinate and socially network among themselves. A good example of this is mixobacteria, which is found in the soil and in organic waste. They have a tendency to group together and in that way they can produce more of the enzymes that they need to break down substances in their environment so that they can use those for um, for nutrient sources. And then uh, similarly, they collectively produce chemical uh, toxins that allow them to compete with other species of bacteria. Now in the Blackboard, I posted a video, uh, a TED talk about how bacteria talk and this topic of quorum sensing and the gal that does the TED talk is really awesome. So I suggest that you watch that. You'll get a better sense of what is going on here. Biofilms are something we're really concerned about in the surgical environment because biofilms are a way of um, bacteria using that quorum sensing to congregate together in communities. And they secrete this really sticky substance from themselves that allows them to attach to organic surfaces like tissues, as well as inorganic surfaces like our instruments, our surgical instruments. And when this happens and they're allowed to dry on there in the example of surgical instruments, it makes it really, really hard to wash off and really difficult for us to then sterilize those instruments. So this is why it's so important when we are breaking down our instrumentation after a surgery that we spray them 
with something that is going to keep them moist and wet. So some sort of enzymatic spray, or we're going to soak them in some sterile water. We never want to soak instruments in saline. That damages the integrity of the metal that the instruments are made of. But soaking them in water or spraying them with some sort of enzymatic spray is going to prevent those biofilms from forming. There are two overarching methods that can be used for bacterial counting. And one is direct measurement and the other is indirect measurement. So we're gonna talk about direct measurement first, and that includes plate counts, filtration, and most probable number and direct count. So plate counts are the most frequently used and it is specifically used to measure the number of viable cells. A disadvantage is, is that you have to wait for these to incubate and for the uh, colonies to grow. So um, after that has occurred, then the colony forming unit or CFU is what is going to be counted. So a lot of times bacteria will occur in clusters, staph or chains, strep, and those are the CFUs that are going to be counted. Now, only plates with approximately 25 to 250 colonies are counted because if there's more, then um, this could result in colonies that aren't fully developed. So uh, they're gonna use ones that have about 25 to 250 colonies on there. Uh, so there's a couple things that they can do. One, they can put the bacteria in a suspension in a liquid, and then they heat up the auger as well, and they mix the two together in the Petri dish. However, this can harm some bacteria that are heat sensitive, and some of the colonies are going to grow within the medium, which can't be counted. So um, sometimes that has its disadvantages. So they came up with another process called the spread plate method. And this a small amount of um, inoculum is poured onto the surface of a solid agar, and then it's allowed to grow and proliferate and then it is counted. This is better because it prevents the penetration of the uh, bacteria into the medium and also it doesn't harm those heat sensitive ones because it doesn't come into contact with the hot melted auger. Filtration is the next one. Um, filtration is used when we want to look at something like a sample of water from the river. Uh, about 100 ml of water is going to be poured through this filter that has very, very small openings in it. And then those are going to be transferred to a dish where they can grow and be counted. The most probable number is going to be a statistical estimation of how many um, bacteria there are. So this assumes that the greater, this is done in a liquid um, uh, situation. So we have some sort of um, diluted solution that has the bacteria in it. And then how many dilutions does it take to where there's no back, uh, bacterial growth noted? Right, so this is going to be the technique that's used when microbes that um, need to be counted can't grow on solid media. And then there's the direct count, which uses a known volume of bacterial suspension. So we know how much and we um, put it on a little slide, a little hang drop slide. It has a grid drawn on it, and then that allows us to count the bacteria that way. Um, and it typically uses one ml of fluid. Um, the good thing about it is that no inoculation is required. Um, it can also be performed through an electronic method, but some disadvantages, motile bacteria are gonna be really difficult to count because they're kind of swimming around, so it's gonna be difficult to identify those. It also doesn't separate the dead ones from the live ones, and um, it requires quite a high concentration to be able to count it.
Now let's talk about indirect measurements, turbidity, metabolic activity, and dry weight. So turbidity has to do with the cloudiness and to determine how many bacteria they are, there are, they're gonna use something called a spectrophotometer. And this shines light through that um, test tube or whatever that has the bacteria floating in it. And the cloudier it is, the less light that's going to reach the other side, that's going to register on the spectrophotometer. And then there's also gonna be another scale that's registering the logarithmic expression, right? the number of bacteria, and so that can be plotted and we can understand how many bacteria there are. Metabolic activity has to do with these different chemicals that the cells produce, right? And so we can get, uh, if we know how much one cell is producing of X and we measure how much is there, we can determine how many bacteria are there. And then lastly, there's dry weight. Dry weight is typically used for like molds and fungi uh, because they're multifilamentous and they have that hyphae and so we dry them and weigh them. Uh, sometimes they do do this with bacteria but always with molds and fungi because they have those long filaments and we have to dry those to determine um, their count. So that brings us to the end of our discussion about chapter six. I hope that it was helpful. I hope that it was somewhat interesting and you uh, are coming away with an understanding of how this material uh, relates to the job that you're going to be doing as a surgical technologist.